Hey, Pastor Eric Colser here. I hope that this sermon resource will bless you in addition to your participation in a local church. If you've been checking us out online and you're not a part of a church family, we'd love to meet you and get to know you in person. But again, we pray and hope that this blesses you and helps build you up to be sent out on Jesus' mission. Uh, we are going through the book of Hebrews, and uh, we're about halfway through. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Um, after subjects that we have covered these last few months, uh, everything uh, including uh, hardened hearts, unbelief, and apostasy, uh, know that it is not coincidence that God places today's specific scripture in truths. And so I want to read it in totality. We'll kind of Go through it verse by verse after, uh, but let's read it in its full context. Hebrews chapter 6, starting with verse 9 all the way to the end of the chapter, verse 20. God's word says this. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things. Things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end. So that you may not be sluggish, but instead, but imitators of those who through faith and patience Inherit the promises. Verse 13. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless, I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves. And in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge, might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. You see this right here, what we just got done reading, what we're going to study here is one of the most beautiful pieces of scripture regarding the one true God keeping his promises and assuring us of salvation and other promises that he makes. Look at verse nine with me again. As he starts off saying, though we speak in this way. And remember when he says that, what has what we've studied before this from last week's tough topic of apostasy to hardened hearts and again unbelief he says yet in your case beloved we feel sure of better things things that belong to salvation so as hard as Last week was and questions that came and prayers that you've had, the unknowns with it, the heartbreak with it, examples of it, knowing it will even continue to happen. He says, though we speak in this way, we are also sure of better things regarding your case and salvation. And what belongs to salvation as we read in verse 9? Well, two things we're going to see in the next couple verses. First in verse 10, the seen fruit from loving service within the church, that God sees our work, our labor, our sacrifices out of that service within the church that's fruit from that salvation. And then verses 11 through 12, an assurance of his promises being fulfilled, which he'll explain even further after verse 12. What belongs to salvation? The seen fruit from the Lord of you and I 
in the loving sacrifices and service within the church, an assurance of his promises fulfilled. First, verse 10. For God is not unjust, so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. I do want to pause on this verse for a moment. This right here, again, is an assurance that God sees your loving service for the saints. So that means to all who are in here that work so hard, serve sacrificially for the church, for the mission, for others to benefit and grow, for those who come extra early to help do the coffee, for those who are greeting and noticing guests and going and extending your hand and, and, and welcoming them within the church. For those who have those late night dinners and meals at your home, getting to know other people. For those who prepare to serve with kids ministry and help out with tech. For those who lead community groups or are faithful in discipleship relationships, as hard as it may be in the sacrifice and that you have to make away from family, away from work during your lunch break, making it happen. Saying the hard things at accountability, but then also being discerning and when to give grace. For those who give so much to build up the body and serve, look what it says here. God sees you. He sees you. You're not overlooked. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work. And, we, and he knows that this is being done as it says here. For the love that you have for him and his name in serving the saints. It is proof of your love for not only God, most importantly God, but for the people, the body of Christ, brothers and sisters adopted into the same family. Your family. He sees it. And then he encourages, as it says in the very end, as you still do. Endure in that. Know he sees you. He's going to bless it. And continue in such sacrifices and service. And church, know this. It means much more from the Lord. I know that. But as a church, we appreciate and see you as well. We really do thank you for your faithfulness, for your service. Again, whether it's anything regarding uh, something that helps in building up the body on Sunday morning to continuing the mission outside of these doors, discipleship relationships, community groups, to the work and service that you may do that is fruit from, again, your salvation that's not even a part of our church, but he uses it to build up the church as a whole. He sees it and he uses it. And I want to share with you, we thank you. We know we probably don't say it enough, but God sees it. We're thankful for you. And it says... Going into verse 11, and this is what we desire for you. Look what verse 11 says. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but instead, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises this right here it is, is an assurance of God using this service for others to act on such convictions, the earnestness. Those are convictions to not be sluggish or lazy in response, but instead act out in faith and patience. That we must do what we can to grow in the knowledge and trust of the assurance of these promises. Because as our knowledge of God's promises grow, the more our hearts start to echo the truth of his promises. English Puritan William Spurstow, he uh, lived in the 1600s and was a forerunner to Richard Baxter. He wrote about God's gospel promises being like stars at night. It's why when we just got done singing the song, we just saying Waymaker, the part of the course that really stuck out to me was right after singing, hearing you guys say it, seeing on the screens, 
promise keeper, light in the darkness, it stuck out to me. Because I remember this illustration that he once gave in his book. He said that when you look into a dark countryside sky, you see very few stars at first. But the longer that you gaze into the sky, your eyes start adjusting to the night light and the more stars start to show up. That he says, quote unquote, until the whole firmament from every quarter with a numberless multitude of stars is richly enameled as with so many golden studs, they start appearing. But that's not the case when you first look out into the darkness. But as your eyes adjust, as you are patient, they start appearing. When we begin to truly trust on God's promises, we're content, we're patient in that trust. The number of his promises, like those stars, the assurance of them, and the light coming from them, may at first seem to be small and weak, as to be insufficient to rid us of our fears, to dispel that darkness. But when we are patient, when we grow in trust, when we read and meditate upon such promises further, we begin to see the thousands of promises in the scripture together with the bright light that shines from them so clearly, so distinctly that they are reminders and assurances to us that he will keep his word. That in fact we are filled with delight and assurance. That's why it says in this verse, we cannot be lazy concerning them. We can't. What does that mean for you? How are you potentially apathetic in truly believing and trusting in his promises? Just like Connor said right before, we sang Waymaker. It's almost like Christianese to say that God fulfills his promises. Do you truly believe that? Are you or are you becoming apathetic in that belief? Because it's true and it's life changing. In verses 13 through 18, the author of Hebrews gives an example of imitation, he says. One who through faith and patience inherited such promises that, listen to the level of trust that he had in the Lord, that he was going to make good on his word. He gives full assurance of it. And the example that he gives that we are to imitate in ways is Abraham. Abraham in the extended promise that God gave when Abraham was about to sacrifice his own son. You want to talk about trust that God is going to fulfill and do what he promised? I don't know if there's a greater example than Abraham. Look what it says in verse 13 through 14. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. Now these two verses right here may not give you too much of the story, but let's read what he is talking about here in Genesis chapter 22. Of course, God made a couple promises to Abraham, some that has carried over to us. But this particular promise is, again, a reminder and assurance right after, right after Abraham was going to sacrifice his one and only son. And right after that angel stops Abraham from his tested faith, as the Hebrew says, and sacrificing his son. And God provides a ram for the the sacrifice. Right after it happens, look what the angel says in representation of God. Verse 15 of Genesis 22, it's on the screens to the left and right of me, if you don't want to flip there. It says, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time. The first time was when he stopped him from heaven. And he said, this is what God says, By myself I have sworn. That's why he's saying this in Hebrews. He swore by himself, declares the Lord. Which, by the way, I always kind of talk to my kids a little bit about the upcoming sermon. We're talking about this. One of my youngest twins was like, 
God swears? I didn't think you were allowed to do that. I was like, not that type of swearing, okay? I'm going to explain this right here. By myself, I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son. I will surely bless you. And I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. I will surely do these things as I even swear on my own name. We know, we heard in the Gospel and Genesis series a few years ago how that is a representation of the Gospel of Jesus Christ when God gave his one and only Son for us. But not only does it represent the Gospel of Jesus Christ, it is an example of the trust we should have in the Lord that he will fulfill his promises, even if it seems like what's being asked or what's being done is completely contradictory to everything we know or think, he will fulfill his promises. That's the thing here. This example here shows certain truths about God and his promises with us explained over these next several verses. Look what verse 15 says now. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. Verse 16, for people swear by something greater than themselves and all their disputes and oath is final for confirmation. Like even when you're starting to doubt, Starting to not trust that God is going to make good on his word. It says right here like he does with Abraham. He does with us. He then swears, makes an oath on his own name to give us an assurance. Remember, anyone in this situation would think God is not going to keep his promise. This is the son, that, that inheritance and the fruit to be multiplied. Generations to come is supposed to be through. How is he going to make good on his promise if he is dead? But Abraham was obedient, it says, and trusted him as hard as it was. And as he did, God provided and saved Isaac. And then he swore on his own promise and covenant. And when someone swears, it's because the other person, again, may be in doubt. They try to swear on the life of another Maybe someone that is viewed upon having greater importance and value. You hear it today. You're talking to somebody and say, I'm going to do it. I don't think you're going to do it. No, I swear I'm going to. I still don't think you're going to do it. No, I swear on my mom's life. I swear on my grandpa's grave. I swear on my beloved cat, Fufu. Okay? Like, you know, like, means something to them. Like, I'm swearing on these things. An oath. Often, and a difference between an oath and a covenant. An oath is a personal or formal declaration of truthfulness or commitment. Often invoking, especially at this time when this was written, a higher power as a witness. It's why in court you swear, putting your hand on the Bible, even though they don't believe in it. They put their hand on a higher authority to swear on it. Inviting judgment shall you prove untrue. Swearing on someone's life means you're inviting that God, that higher power to take vengeance upon you or the loved ones that you are swearing on. Again, common practice between believers, unbelievers. And you got to think only a monster would invite the death of a family member, somebody that they love. So they must be speaking the truth. And what does God do right here? God swears, makes an oath on his own name. The eternal, incomparable, unbreakable self and nature and character of God. And look what verse 17 through 18 says about that. Everything that it beautifully means and gives for us as assurance. Verse 17, so when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his promise. He guaranteed it with an oath. He's swearing on his own name because he's guaranteeing it with an oath. Look at verse 18 says, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is, I love this right here, impossible for God to lie. We who have fled for refuge 
might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. That when God desired to more convincingly show the heirs of the promise that he will 100% fulfill what he promised, he did so by making an oath like we do. And it was God assuring us, giving us confirmation that he doesn't just make promises, he keeps them. And it says here two unchangeable truths about God. You can read different commentaries, different opinions on what those two truths are. Almost all of them are very similar to each other. I believe lean toward those two unchangeable truths as being described here. One being God's nature, which as it says here is unchangeable. And two being his publicly declared oath. And it can't go back on it. And as we see this, we know this, that the certainty of God's promise is ultimately found in who he is. Yes, he's assuring it in himself, but as he assures it in himself, he makes that oath based on, I swear on my own name, you must, we must remember who he is when he does that. And what is the characteristic, the attribute that they highlight here the most when speaking of his promises? What does it say here? God does not lie. That's what it says here. I mean, exactly. It is impossible for God to lie. Absolutely impossible. No ifs, no ands, no buts. God will not go back on his promises or alter them. And listen, church, I know this. I know that's foreign to us. Even as we talk about a God that many of you guys do love, have a relationship with, it's foreign to us. Because we all lie and we live in a world that constantly lies. I mean, it's biblical. Psalm 12, Psalm 116. Every man is a liar. Every one of us. Listen, you lie. Kids, we know you lie to your parents. Parents, we know you lie to your kids sometimes. Spouses, friendships, the closest of closest of friends. Listen, as one that's supposed to be, you know, a representative of truth, a pastor, okay? I lie. I caught myself when writing this. I caught myself and recognized I said I was going to text this person back with some resources for something a few days ago. I'm writing this, and I'm like, I didn't even fulfill my word there. I felt bad. I was like, hurry up and stop, and like did that, and then went back to it. I, at times, lie. Every one of us. And listen, beyond just us, every one of us being sinners in that way, we know there are consequences and deep hurt for living in a society, in a world of broken promises. We feel that. As long as I was in serving in student ministry, seeing how many broken or dysfunctional family situations was because of a break of trust when somebody wasn't faithful to the covenant, the promise that they made in marriage. To parents saying to kids, I'll be right back. I will always be there and then abandoning their family. Having a huge burden for that, ministering to it, experiencing myself before becoming a Christian. It caught my eye when a certain TV show premiered a few years back on HBO. Let me give my disclaimer. I have never watched this, and I would not recommend for any of you to watch it. I'm saying that right now. One time I made an illustration of Game of Thrones, and you should have seen the emails that I got back with that, okay? So I'm going to tell you guys right here and right now. I haven't watched it. I don't encourage you to watch it. But because of my huge burden for teenagers, I heard of a show coming out a few years ago about teenagers, partying lifestyle, addictions, a whole bunch of different things that everybody was hyped up for, excited for. And since it premiered, between 16 to 19 million people have watched it since. That over the last decade, it is the second most popular show on HBO outside of Game of Thrones. And in this show that, again, haven't watched, but would read the recap of 
after each episode, knowing how many people were watching, knowing and hearing that this is supposed to be glamorizing, like certain things of the culture, partying lifestyle, uh, things of, of, of gender, and uh, I was interested kind of with what the premise of the show and what it was, what it was uh, communicating. And when I would read these recaps, you'd see how almost every character, almost every teenager, that their sinful decisions were in result as the first season showed a background of every character of the show, that a lot of their lifestyle was the result of a loss of parent, sinful choices from parents, and especially prevalent and shown and relevant to what we're speaking to today, broken promises of those parents. That from what I've read, this series showing in a very heartbreaking fashion that the world does realize as much as it wanted to potentially champion sin, it couldn't but help to show the consequences of sin and the breakdown of family as God intended it to be. I mean, one character who's supposed to be the villain kind of in the series, but became that way because had a dad that cheated on his wife and did it with a transvestite underage person that caused this character to start questioning gender stuff. I'm like, that's the exact opposite that culture wants to tell you, right? That's the exact opposite they want to say in upbringing and all those things. But can't but help to show how much it affected them. That another character who's been teared up reading about this background episode, whose mom was an alcoholic, dad she absolutely adored and loved and admired, and he tried to be a good dad, but after being hurt so much by his spouse, ended up cheating, getting into drugs, and leaving his family. And then this character, it straight up showed and shared how for the rest of her time, how much she craved other boys' attention out of a deep loss and hurt from a dad that broke his promises and that she ultimately wanted. To the main character, played by Zendaya, grew up Disney Channel, greatest showman, newest Spider-Man movies. And in this family dynamic, a great single mom just doing her best, loving her kids, and having her spouse dying from cancer, not because of sinful choices, but a sinful broken world. And although, again, nothing that they particularly did, but that main character going into a real hard graphic from what it sounds like, portrayal and lifestyle of addiction to drugs, but in her heart and mind, even though it wasn't his fault, a dad that said he was always going to be there, but then was lost by cancer in her view. Although it wasn't his fault, you went back on your word and a deep anger because of it, going off into those things. And you see 16 to 19 million people see that, and they feel and they relate to that hurt because it reminds them of their consequences. Because even people in this very room who's been hurt by lies and broken promises, and you recognize in your life, you feel like certain stability is gone. Trust has been gone. It is hard for you to trust someone. Disrespect starts with those people that won't ever fulfill their word. That you start to feel unimportant and unvalued. The ability to believe and even receive truth becomes distorted. And that lies become more comfortable as it was your temporary reality. And sadly, often you start repeating the same cycle, thinking it's okay to break promises yourself. And we are left, listen here, we are left yearning and hoping that someone, anyone, will do what they actually said. Fulfill what they promise. Especially regarding the promises of what we are ultimately created for, need, live for. Ones of love. Ones of care and provision protection and we come to this beautiful truth right here not that we should just know but believe and receive that we can trust that God keeps his promises
That's why these two unchangeable truths about God is here. A reminder. It is impossible for God to lie. And listen, look, reread what it says right there. And we can run to that refuge. You know what a refuge is? It's a place we can feel safe and protected from the hurt, the brokenness, the stuff that went on before. And it says here, we can run to his refuge. For we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us that God will not lie. That's why there's beauty, there's power of those stories and situations of fostering and adoption. Again, with broken family situations and especially ones where it gets to a place of either fostering or adoption. And so many, so many of those situations, you see the hurt, the mistrust because of broken promises. And although even in our situations, it's not perfect, you get a glimpse, a glimpse of that refuge that God brings us in. And we find that great encouragement and hope and the assurance of God's promises fulfilled where Jesus does that to us perfectly. Conclusion, look at verses 19 through 20. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now that last statement in verse 20, becoming that high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, there's an entire chapter on that. That's next week, okay? So we'll cover that next week. Let's focus on verse 19 and the, verse, and the beginning of verse 20. It says, we have this sure and steadfast anchor of the soul that Jesus enters into the inner place behind the curtain. You guys may remember Pastor Joey's sermon a few weeks ago, how he's our great high priest that did this. And Jesus doesn't just go there. He brings us there. And he places a sure and steadfast anchor there for us to know, remember, this is our home. And remember, when and where an anchor is used. Because this is used as an illustration of God's word. That in the midst of the worst of storms and the choppy waves that hit across that boat, the anchor holds the ship in place and that Christ is the anchor of our soul. That no matter the circumstances in the storms that we face, no matter what we are feeling, no matter the emotions, the fear of what we see around us, can you imagine those people in the midst of the ocean on that boat and as the towering waves are crashing against it, that they look out and the endless sea can swallow them whole. And you can't even think and comprehend the sea monsters that are in there that we don't even know that much about because they're so far in the depths of the sea that we can't even get there and study them and know exactly what that is. All we have is like things and maps and old history of these gigantic like squids like this big, okay? And the reason why my beloved wife Jessica will only go into the ocean right up to there, okay? Because she doesn't trust what's out there. In the midst of all the scariest things on that boat in the midst of the storm, the anchor holds you in place. And Jesus Christ is that sure and steadfast anchor for us. Our boat and our soul is anchored to the holy of holies where God is present and he protects and provides and forever loves us because of Jesus. That Jesus Christ, as we read a few chapters ago, when he entered into the holy and holies, Holy of Holies, once and for all, where God's presence is, he placed an anchor there, connecting back to us. 
that believers are called to hold fast to the hope set before us, as verse 18 says. But we hold fast to Jesus by trusting in and standing on and holding on to the unchanging promise and purpose of God that he gives us in Jesus Christ. Again, remember, an anchor is not something exactly that you hold. If you were to go out to Lake Cumberland and you see a man standing on his big old pontoon rental with a chain in hand, you're like, what are you doing? It's like, I'm holding on to the anchor. It's like, no, that anchor's holding on to you, my friend. And that's what Jesus Christ does for us. As that goes into the sea, into the water, hidden from our view, going down into the depths, you cannot see it, but it holds you. And Jesus, although at times it feels like hidden from our view, not because he's down in the depths, but because he's ascended to the highest of places, he has you anchored with him. He died to save you. He lives to keep you. And in Christ, your entrance into heaven is as sure as the reality that he is already there because he is your anchor. And this means, lastly, that the certainty of God's promise is not just found in who God is. It is. And it's a God that never, ever lies. But it's found in who Jesus is. It's found in who Jesus is. The two are one. And as verse 20 indicates, because of this, we gain an assurance, a certainty of God's promises. I had mentioned before, by looking at not only who he is, but who Christ is. And as we look at Christ, as he is revealed in the promises of the gospel, he gives us assurance. His unchangeable work finished on the cross as he defeated sin, Satan, and death once and for all, taking our sins upon him. That he rose from the grave. And you can't reverse that. He's not going back into the grave. He has arisen, defeating it. And out of grace, he extends something you cannot earn, something you do not deserve, a great gift of eternal life, a forever father who will never, ever, ever lie to you that will be with you, protecting, providing, loving you forever. If you repent of your sins and have saving faith in him. So to conclude, church, if you're a Christian in here, after reading the last few chapters about hardened hearts and doubts and apostasy, we know that in God's great grace, we can enjoy and trust the assurance that God has settled our accounts forever because he is satisfied with Christ for you as he is for every one of those who have repent and believed and has become his people and children. That when God took an oath, he put himself on the line for that promise. He said, in effect, let me fall under my own judgment if I do not fulfill this. If I do not give this to you. And then in Jesus Christ, God placed himself under his own judgment. So that he would fulfill the promise that he will save you and anchor you to himself. Jesus Christ is that oath. He fulfilled that oath. And Jesus Christ is the guarantee of God's promise. And in him, we can be sure that we have him forever. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for your word. Just like Christ is the anchor to you. And that you will fulfill all promises in all such ways. We know that your word as is revealed even this morning is an anchor to what is true and what we need. God, I don't know what those who are sitting out here is exactly going through. Maybe the storms that are in their life. Maybe the hurt, deep hurt from certain broken promises and sin. But we can trust and know that you will fulfill your word with us. That you can change any situation, give life to the gospel and anchor it. That no matter what we see before us, what fear we may feel in our hearts, we can trust and know we have you. We're anchored to you. 
and that you'll fulfill all such promises. Thank you, Lord. As we even believe that right now, let us behold you. Let this next song be worship to you as we behold your glory and your greatness and that as we sing this, we will sing this knowing from what we just heard in God's word that it is promises fulfilled. It is true. You are reigning in heaven as king over all. And as you do that, you're a loving father that fulfills every promise. Behold you as we worship you. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.